Well, hey, we're going to jump in. Uh, you know, several years ago, we began each year by talking about one of our core values. And over the last several years, we've talked about, you know, they hang in the lobby out there. We've talked about rescue people, rescue people. We've talked about rescue people, serve people. We've talked about rescue people, worship together. We've talked about loving God, loving people, and making Jesus known. And this year, we, uh, before we jump into the book of Acts, we are going to talk about another one of our core values so that at some point in the future, we'll have a whole set of something, you know, uh, resources about each of our core values. This core value that we're going to start with, uh, that we're going to, you know, start our year with today, is is not one of the. I would say, uh, if you could say fun, it's not one of the fun ones to talk about. Often it's uncomfortable for for a pastor to speak about, and often it's uncomfortable for people to hear about. But I pray that you will stay with us, uh, that you might even even stay in the light of what might be uncomfortable as we talk about it, because the core value we're going to spend. And today and the next two weeks talking about is this one. Rescued people give generously. Rescued people give generously. And you guys are already so good at giving. Uh, but here, here's the deal when we talk about generous. Nobody knows what generous is, does it? I mean, we could do all that we're doing and still not be generous, couldn't we? Because some people can give a gift of $5 and that was a very generous gift. Some people could give a gift of $100,000 and it wouldn't be so generous. Because generosity, well, generosity is a, it's a sliding scale. It's a sliding scale and it often depends on where a person is and what's going on in their life. Webster defines generous as this. The readiness, the readiness, like, like there's no apprehension there. If you're a generous person, the generous person is not the one that's like... The generous person is with like, you know, I am ready. The readiness to give more than what is expected. And there's our key word, to others. Generous people think others first. Others first. Last Sunday, Rick Murphy, Mike, and I, as Micah uh, told you about in the uh, welcome this morning, we came to the building to talk with anyone who might not have gotten the message that we were online because of all the, li- the, the, the lice, the ice in our parking lot. We might have had lice in the parking lot too, I don't know, but anyway... <laughs> Hopefully the cold killed them if we did. Uh, uh, you know, and one of the people, there weren't many people that showed up, but one, one gentleman showed up and I got to talk to him for a few minutes out in the parking lot. And I had met him a couple of weeks before. He may even be here now and not knowing that he has become a sermon illustration. Somebody gave me a hat that says, Pastor, anything you say can and might be used in a sermon. But anyway, <laughs> I, I might should have had that on last week. But so we're talking. And uh, in our conversation, he says, he goes, this, this would have been like my third time here. Let me tell you what I love about here. He said, first thing I love is the music. I love the music. I love the music. He said, another thing that, uh, that I like about here that's a little bit different from other, some of the churches that we visited around, he says, y'all don't excessively talk about money, do you? And I thought, next week, I wonder like... <laughs> And it, it, my, my heart started beating a little bit, but guess what? He, he asked how he could sign up to give online right there in the parking lot. So I thought, hey man, you know, this, this is for you. In full disclosure, I want you to know up front. This series is, we can talk about serving, but we've talked about it. This series, three weeks only, three weeks only. So today you're a third done. You're a third done if you're like, three weeks and we'll be, we'll, we'll be done with this and we'll move on. But I hope if, you're, if you are a first time guest with us or if you are one of our people that you'll stay in the light, that you'll stay in the light of what might be uncomfortable and listen to what Jesus has to say. It's not meant to be about guilt because I don't think Jesus ever wants us to to be about guilt. Everyone's situation is different. These are principles from Scripture that I hope that you will take with. And wherever you are in your financial journey with your possessions and with your stuff, what I hope this will do will give us just a little bit of guidance as we jump in in to this series. Uh, and you know, when, when I looked back at our history, this is only the fourth actual little series I've done about money in our nine, in nine years. So I thought when I heard that, when, when I looked back on that, I thought, you know what, maybe I should apologize. The reason I thought I might should apologize is this, because Jesus said more about money than he did any other single subject. Did you know about that? He said more about money than he said about hell or heaven. He said more about our possessions than he did about hell or heaven combined. He said more about money than he did faith and forgiveness. And if you were to go back and ask me many years ago, what is the thing that Jesus talked most about while he was on earth? But I would have said, well, you know, it's grace, it's forgiveness, it's love. Everybody got to have love. You know, that's what I would have thought. But when in reality, when I look at it, over 25% of the parables of Jesus talk about our money and the way we use the stuff that comes our way. 
outside of the parables, conservative estimates say that 15% of everything else Jesus said was about our money and how we used it. And here is the reason. Here is the reason. <laughs> Nothing will compete more with your commitment to God than your money. Nothing will compete more with your commitment to God than your stuff. The more stuff you have, the more opportunities you will have to move further and further away from your heavenly Father. What I hope we discover in the next three weeks is that according to Jesus, there is a connection between our spiritual walk and our spiritual lives and how we think about it and how we handle the stuff that comes our way. And if you're like me, you probably had to, you probably maybe developed in your mind this bucket. You know, my faith is over here. My finances are over here. But what Jesus will teach is that one follows the other. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, perhaps the greatest principle about our stuff, Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, it's repeated three different times in Scripture, is this verse. We talked about it a little bit earlier in, uh, uh, back in 2023. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So what does that mean? If you were to read all of 19 and 21, that's just the A and the B of two verses there. If you were to read all of that chapter, what you would find is that Jesus is not saying that stuff is bad. Jesus is not even saying that having some treasures on earth is necessarily bad. But what Jesus is saying is that a heart that seeks to continually store up and accumulate and accumulate and the desire for more earthly stuff is not a heavenly position. And not because stuff is bad, but because stuff won't last. Because stuff won't last. Randy Alcorn, in his book about finances, said these words. When Jesus warns us not to store up treasures on this earth, it's not because wealth might be lost, but it is because wealth will always be lost. Either it, speaking of wealth, either wealth leaves us while we live, or we leave it when we die. There are no exceptions to that. Today and for the next two weeks, we're going to take a look at three myths about money and then three stories that Jesus told. Myth number one for today, only one for today. Myth number one is this. It's all about me. It's all about me. Now, on the surface, we, we, none of us would say that, do we? But what we say and how we live... Well, it could be two different things. Story number one, behind myth number one, is about a rich man and his money. And in Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a story about a rich man. And by the way, as we go into this, one thing we all need to hear, we're all rich. Even the poorest of us in America are rich because of what we have access to. If your car, I think I've told you this before, if your car has its own little house, you are rich. <laughs> if you own more than two pair of shoes, two outfits... You are richer than 60% of the people who live on planet Earth. One billion people, according to globalissues.org, currently live on less than $2 a day. One billion people. 80% of all humanity lives on less than $30 a day. 2.6 billion people in our world do not have access to running water or a bathroom, basic sanitation. And 50 million people in our world while we sit here do not know where their next meal is coming from. If you live in America, you are rich. Which means, as we begin, that what Jesus is about to say in the story is for us. Because we are the rich guy, the rich person. Luke 12 opens up with Jesus talking to the crowds about so many different things. And there is a mob of people following him if you were to read Luke 12. And in this parable that he's about to tell, or in the, in the real life happening there before he tells the parable, a man approaches Jesus in the crowd. And the picture I get, if you want to go home and read Luke 12, the picture I get is that the man yells out. And the man yells out a question and, or, or a, a request from Jesus. And the request is this, would you tell, would you tell my family member to divide my estate so that I could get my fair share of what's coming to me. In other words, tell my family to give me my money. And the answer that Jesus gives this man through the parable actually, actually gives us an example of the opposite of generous. And remember, if generous is the readiness to give more than what is expected to others, well, 
what Jesus is going to talk about is the other G word that is not generous, but here we go, greed, greed. Greed is the intense, according to Webster, desire for self. So Luke 12, 15, when this man says, Hey, Jesus, I want you to tell my family member to divide the estate between us and give me what is coming to me. Jesus says this, Luke 12, 15, to the guy. He says, watch out, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life is not about having a lot of possessions, which is really not the American way, is it? And right off the bat, you find out that Jesus defines greed this way. Jesus defines greed as the desire for more for me. The desire for more for me. And of all the things Jesus has talked about, the request that this man comes up with is make my family give me more money. And to that request, Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 12. It goes like this. So Jesus told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So right off the bat, we know the man was rich, don't we? We know the man that was like us. He had enough already. And in this man, who was already defined as rich, more is coming his way. And isn't that the way we kind of think of The rich get richer. How many of you have heard that? The rich get richer and the poor get poor. And even if you look at the news, that's how trends and charts kind of, you know, if you can believe them, that's what they look like in our country. The rich, you know, it takes money to make money. You know, I've always, you know, I've always heard that. Well, same thing back then. So all the people in their crowd would have been doing what you guys are doing. You know what? Yep, 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 yep. That's right. That's right. So verse 17, he thought to himself, the man who was rich and who had more was coming his way thinks to himself. And in thinking to himself, I want you to notice the caution here. When more comes his way and he thinks to himself, he only thinks about himself. He thinks like a lot of people today think when more comes our way. What can I buy? What can I do? What can I get? You know, Jesus did say it is more blessed to give than receive, but how many of us have thought, I like the receiving end of that as well. You know, I, I like the other half of that. And this is kind of what's going on there. So he thinks to himself, this is what he thinks, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. His closet was like my closet. There is not room for another shirt. If I get another shirt, i got to get rid of a shirt. i got to take a shirt to the garage. One comes in, one goes out. I need, to, I need to double that up. I have no place to store my shoes. I mean, I heard several people at first, I have no place to store my shoes. i got so much stuff that I need a storage unit. i got so much stuff that I need. Is there a contractor in here who can help me build a bigger garage? Because I need to add one on for the stuff because I really don't want to pay over them to store this stuff. How many of you, I have heard story after story, that you move from one house to another house and five years later you still got stuff in boxes from stuff that you move that you, you don't even know. Well, we can all relate to this. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. I'm going to have to hire somebody to help me figure out what to do with all my stuff. And oh, by the way, more stuff is coming my way. I'm getting a better raise. I'm getting a better job. A windfall. A bonus. I've got stuff and more stuff keeps coming. What do I do? So he has an idea. Verse 18. He says to himself, which is just, I, I do that a lot. Often I will leave here, and somebody will have said something, and I'll say to myself as I'm leaving. Well, anyway, often Linda and I will have a conversation, and I will say to myself things that I probably would not want to say out loud because I want her to love me forever. Anyway, <laughs> the man says to himself when he has this idea that more is coming my way, and I want, what I want you to do is I want you to pretend you've never heard the story before. Some of you haven't. But for those of you who have, I want you to pretend that you've never heard it before. And what I want you to notice is this. When the man says to himself, i got more stuff, i got stuff, i got more stuff coming. What am I going to do? Well, this is what I'll do. What I want you to notice in this story is this. The man will do what he has always done, which is normal. What shall I do? My business is great. And look at all this stuff that I've got. And look at all the stuff that's coming my way. What will I do? Well, I will do what I've always done. And here is the principle of money. That whether you're a believer in Jesus or not is true. You will do with more exactly the same thing you do with less. You will do with more what you do with less. The more money you make doesn't mean that you will change a thing. In fact, every study that I have found says that you will not. You will not make a change until the Holy Spirit makes a change in you. 
my personal experience when I think family, friends that I had from school, friends that I have from church, my friend group. Uh, it's true. The friends who were generous then are generally generous now. And the friends that I had then who said, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait and go on a mission trip when my kids leave the house. I'm going to support that cause when my kids get out of private school or when I graduate from college or when I get my house paid off or when I pay for retirement. And now it's 40 years later if they're my age and their house is almost paid for or paid for and their kids are out of the house and the debt is gone and it's minimal, but they're still doing kind of the same thing they've always done. The principle is this, you will do with more the same thing you did with less. It doesn't mean that you will change anything. And I love it when studies reveal what God has already revealed because it took a university study to come up with that. But look at what Jesus said four chapters later. He said, and the one who is faithful with little will be faithful with, say that word with me, much. And the one who is unfaithful with little will be unfaithful with much. Most of you know that one of my heroes uh, uh, in my growing up in early 20s and 30s is Rick Warren. I worked at an explosives company at that time, and I would go to Southern California to uh, take a week-long training that I had to have uh, in the explosives industry business, and I would go to Saddleback while I was there. And on one particular occasion, I heard Rick, and he wasn't bragging when he said this. In fact, if you were able to see the whole clip, he would say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this to, to make a point. I'm not telling you this to brag because I kept this a secret for 25 years. He wrote the best-selling book of all time, and he told us on this Sunday, he said, he said I could have have bought an entire island in the South Pacific with all the money that has come in from the book that I have sold or that I have written. But watch what he said. Last week when I was uh, testifying at the um, at DC, at the Congress, I was testifying before Senate. Uh, one of the guys took me aside, Senator, and he asked me a question. He says, you know, Rick, I know this thing about Purpose Driven Life. It sold a gazillion copies, best-selling book in the world. Uh, you know, for four years, it was the best, it's the best-selling nonfiction book in American history. It's in 137 languages, it's in Guinness, it's the most translated book in the world, except for the Bible. It has two Guinness records. And he goes, why do you think God chose you to write the best-selling nonfiction hardback in all the time? I said, oh, I know why. I know why. He said, why? I said, because God knew he could trust me with the money. God knew that I would not spend it on my stuff. I wouldn't go buy a bigger house. I, I, I wouldn't go buy a bigger car. Uh, you know, I wear a watch from Walmart. You know, I, live, I drive a 15-year-old Ford truck. God knew I wouldn't spend the money on myself. I would use it to help more other people. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, shoot, if I wrote a gazillion seller, I'd give away millions too. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. I guarantee you would. Why? Because you're not being generous right now. And I was generous when we were out of work. And I was generous when I had no money. And I was generous when the cupboard was bare. And I was generous when Kay was holding the job and I was trying to put me through school. And I had a 40-year track record of being generous. And God knew he could trust me. And with that generosity came additional influence. And as I sat there in that day in the audience, it made a difference in the way I would use my funds from that day forward. And in the story that Jesus is telling, the rich guy will do what the rich guy has always done because he assumed what he had always assumed, that when more comes my way, the more is for me. The fact that he got more did not make him generous towards God. It only made him richer on earth. Verse 18, so he said to himself, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. Let me ask you a question. What do you do with your surplus grain? Grain, stuff, money. What do you do with your extra money? I know some of you are thinking, I don't have extra money. And some of you are right. You, you, you don't have extra money. The, the, the reasons why, you know, can be explored and are probably varied. But let me ask this to, to kind of bring it around. Uh, uh, and don't get mad. Just getting a little bit personal here. Have you taken a vacation in the last couple of years? Anybody have a car? Anybody have two cars? Anybody have two cars and kids who are still living at home and your kid has a car? Does your car have its own little house? Have you ever driven a good car to a car lot and then left it parked there while you drove away with another good car? 
And the last time you bought a cell phone, did you take a perfectly good working cell phone into the store and trade it in for another perfectly good cell phone because you wanted more, bigger, better, shinier, newer? And I'm not saying that if you take any one of those things in and of itself that that's bad. But what Jesus is saying, if that attitude categorizes your life, is a description of you, then you may have a problem with generosity. Because when I ask those questions, we've all done that. Because people with extra, we don't wait for things to break. We upgrade. We trade things in. We buy two or three because that's the basic American way of living. And the sad thing is, it's become the basic American way of living for most of us who follow Jesus. And when more comes my way, if I'm like most people in the world, I will fall into one of two categories. Category number one is this. I will spend it right then on something I want. Or I will upgrade something I have. A new kitchen, a new room, a new bathroom, a bigger closet. Because I want newer, better, different color, whatever. That's category number one. Category number two is this. I may not spend it now, but I will save it now so that I'll make sure that I have enough money so that when I retire, I can retire sooner, better, quicker, faster. I spend it now or I save it for labor. Those are the most common things that people do when more comes their way. So he said to himself, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. In verse 19. And I'll say to myself, self, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Go play golf. Go to the beach. Ski down the mountain. Whatever you want. Eat, drink, and be merry. And you know what the truth is? I think the truth of the matter is this. If you had taken most of us, I know there are exceptions to every rule, but if you had taken most of us when we were 20, 25, maybe even 30 years old, and you had said to us, do you know what you'll be making when you're 40? Do you know what your income will be when you're 45, 50, or 55? You know what we would have said? No way. I mean, no way. I mean, I can't believe that. I mean, if I were making that much when I'm 40, 45, or 50, they won't have to ask for anything down at their church building. I mean, that charity will not have to ask for money because I'll be taking it out of my wallet and I'll be giving them this and I'll support this and I'll do this and I'll do this. But you know what the truth of the matter is? If you're not faithful with what you're making at 20, the odds are very much in your favor that you will not be faithful with what you make when you are 55, 60, 65, or 70. All of those things going together. And what we'll see as we go through this the next two weeks, that Jesus is not going to put down wealth. That is not the point of this whole thing. What he is going to put down is the idea that as stuff comes your way, that you buy first, that you take care of you first, that you tear down your barns and you build bigger first. You see, science and Jesus do agree. Getting more money doesn't make you more Jesus. Doesn't make you more generous. Getting more money only makes you better at doing what you're already doing. And this is where we're going to wind down. And this guy's like, wow, more is coming my way. What am I going to do? But then the story takes a turn because God enters the story. And to the man, he says, foolish, foolish way of living. That way of thinking is folly. And it started with Jesus' very definition of greed. You see, greed is hard to see in the mirror. You know where greed is best seen? In my closet. In my house. In my cars. In my wallet. In my bank account. And God comes back to the man and God says in verse 20, But God said to him, How foolish this way of thinking. This very night, your life will come to an end. And what the man had never dreamed is that he would run out of time before he would run out of money. It never dawned on him in all of the thinking, what am I going to do for me now? What am I going to do over here? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do this? And then the parable, Jesus then asked a question. He steps out of really the parable. And he, he asked this question then. What about the things that you have prepared for yourself? What about the eating and drinking and being merry? Who will get those things now? And the answer is somebody else. 
but not because he was generous, but because he was gone. And then Jesus steps out of the parable back into real life, and he looks in the story, and in verse 21, he says these words. This is how it will be for whoever, whoever, that's me, whoever, that's you, whoever, whoever stores up for them things, things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Generous people are people who have come to realize that not everything that comes my way was meant for me. So what do I do with what I've heard today? Let me close with these words. Most of us use our money like this. It's the American way. We spend it first, don't we? I mean, I fall into this trap. You know, more comes my way, I spend it first. What I want, what I need, what I think I would like to have, a newer, bigger, better, whatever. And then if there's any left over, we save it. And if you're like 80% of Americans, the only time you save is when somebody takes the money from you first, like out of your check. Because it's, 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 just, it's just hard. Because this pull of the world is so much. Everything on TV pulls us here. We save it, and then if there's any left, you know what we do? We give it. Then if there's enough, we give it. In the parable that Jesus is talking about, how do you be rich towards God? How do you not store up for yourself treasures on this earth, but become rich towards God? Well, the parable says you do that by turning the habit upside down to give it first. Whenever something comes your way, Whenever a blessing comes your way, whether it's a, a raise or a bonus or, you know, a, whatever it is, a windfall that comes your way, instead of the first thing being, oh, Linda, look, this came, well, what can we do? Where can we go? What can we, what, what can we do? Because I like, I, like, I like to dream like that sometimes. What if I could get my wife when more comes my way and say, hey, I know there are a lot of things that we could do with this, but what could we do that would help somebody else? What could we do? that would feed into the kingdom of God. What could we do with this that would build a treasure that would last, not for just my lifetime, but would last for a million years? What could I invest in that would last forever? Because most of the time, the answer is not a bigger barn or a bigger house or a bigger whatever, and those things aren't necessarily bad. It's just, when those are the things we think about first. So in any conversation about money and stuff and possessions, where Jesus starts is this. Change the way you think. And when more comes your way, whisper to yourself, it's not about me. So, as Jesus would say, do not, Tom, to not store up for yourself treasures on this earth where so many things can happen, where moth and dust and rust corrupt. But instead, do the opposite. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Moth can't get it there. Rust, not around. No thief can break through and steal. For I tell you the truth, Jesus says, the place where you put your treasure is the place where I find your heart. Father, I thank you for uh, challenging me. I thank you, Father, for speaking to me first before I even spoke to this crowd of people. I thank you, Father, for sitting in an auditorium with a man who challenged me many years ago. And I pray, Father, that I can become more and more and more like your son. That, Father, when, the, when people line up and they say goodbye to me, it will not be because of all the stuff I've gained here, but it will be about the treasure I've laid up forever. May I invest in a kingdom that lasts beyond a lifetime. May I invest in a kingdom that lasts through eternity. And all of God's people said, hey, amen. I hope you have an incredible week. Pick you up a black bag on the way back, on the way out, and deliver it to an exciting little person today. I love you all. 